questions. This is session ITG 10, task group, minimum information about a digital specimen, MIDS. Uh, it's being held on the 23rd of September, 2020, UTC 1200 to 1400. And I'm going to begin by making some introductory remarks. I want to introduce myself as uh, one of the two uh, conveners of this new Tadwick task group. My name is Alex Hardesty and I'm from the Cardiff University School of Computer Science and Informatics in Wales in the United Kingdom. And I'm also a member of the DISCO technical team. The other convener of this uh, task group is Elspeth Haston from the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh, Scotland in the UK. Elspeth is also chair of the digitization working group of, of CTAF, a consortium of European taxonomic facilities. Today we have some technical support uh, provided by Quinton Groom from the Miser Botanic Garden in Belgium and by Holly Little from the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in the United States. And I'm grateful to both of those for, for providing this technical support and for all of you for joining this session today. Welcome. I want to thank you for joining us in this first meeting of the new task group on, on MIDS. Uh, the session will be recorded for, for later viewing. Uh, the purpose of the session today is to introduce the topic to, to TADWIG members, to set out the steps and the working method towards a proposed TADWIG standard and to engage some new participants in this work. There are some session notes available or will be available in the Google Doc. Uh, the, li the link is there, bit.ly tgmids one notes and it will be posted into the chat uh, now. Please go there and add your name under the red heading of participants. Uh, you can also enter notes there and questions there if you wish to do so at, at, at any, any time and they will be dealt with. Our session format today is going to be interactive. Uh, I'm going to start by giving you uh, uh, some background about the purpose of the, the, this newly constituted task group and its charter. This will be uh, followed by a presentation by Elspeth giving an introduction to the minimum information about digital specimens at standard. And then we'll have a session on questions for, for clarification, opening up into a wider discussion of, of, of any issues raised by any of the participants in this session. We'll then look at our proposed plan of work uh, for this task group, uh, and that's in the section uh, in the charter that's, that's headed strategy. Uh, we will also then engage some, some participants in this session by collecting some user stories from different parts of the community. We'll ask you to, to interactively contribute some ideas by filling in some, some Google Slides, and towards the end, we'll summarize and close. Please treat this task group session as an equal opportunity for all of us to contribute. Be polite and kind and inclusive of each other and remember the Tadwig Code of Conduct. The chat function is available for asking questions and making subsidiary points. Please use it carefully and appropriately. Improper use may result in you being removed from the session or in the chat function being disabled. Please keep your microphones muted when not speaking. And if you wish to speak, use the raise hand function that Zoom offers. Please bear with us for any technical difficulties that we may have, and we hope that you will enjoy the event. Okay, so I want to give you some background about the purpose of this tag group, this task group and, and its charter. You can find all of this information uh, in the charter, which is appended to the end of the session notes in full. Uh, the charter is not yet available on the TADWIG website, uh, but will be so uh, shortly. The TADWIG uh, executive approved this task group uh, a, a month or so ago, and we're now going through the administrative processes of, of setting up uh, the appropriate web pages and, and GitHub repositories. But to give you some background, we've been working on, as you know, in Europe, we've been working on uh, planning uh, and designing the, the DISCO research infrastructure, the distributed system of scientific collections. 
And one of the things that we discovered early in this work, beginning in, in 2018 or so, is that when we talk to different people, we find that the term digitization is understood very diversely. Different people understand it as meaning taking images of specimens or transcribing uh, label data, collecting label data, or just of clear creating records in collection management systems. And we also found that different people have different views about what sufficient digitization means. And we concluded during the course of our, our work that a harmonizing framework captured as a Tadwig standard could help to clarify the levels or depth of digitization and the minimum information to be captured and published at each level. And that such a framework would help us to ensure that enough data are captured, curated and published against specific requirements so that this data about specimens on the internet is useful for the widest possible range of, of purposes, both research and teaching and learning. Such a framework would also make it easier for institutions and, and collection managers to measure the extent of digitization that's being achieved over time and to help them to set their priorities for the remaining work. You can find further background about this in the charter. Thus, we proposed a Tadwick standard as minimum information about digital specimens, MIDS. And this borrows on ideas in other areas of, of biology, notably in, 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 in the genomics domain, where minimum information standards have been widely adopted and used over many years. So the purpose of this task group is to build on this work that has already been begun in Europe's DISCO program, which we undertook in collaboration with the United States AD, ADBC program through IDIGBIO. And together we want to take that forward to a draft Tadwig standard by the autumn of next year. The goal is to broaden the applicability and to achieve an international consensus that leads to a widespread adoption and implementation of MIDS. Outputs from this task group will include the draft standard itself, a summary of the use cases that the standard can serve, reports of pilot implementations, and evaluations of the standard's content to learn lessons about how useful it is and what needs to be improved. Output would also, can also include appropriate proposals for mid support by other TADBIG standards, such as in Darwin Core, ABDC, ABCD, collection descriptions, etc. If you want to see the latest version of, of the specification, which is being injected as the starting point into this task group work, you can find the latest draft, which was prepared in July 2020, at that short link, bit.ly. MIDS V011 version uh, 0.11. Okay, so with that short introduction about the, the background to the task group and its purpose, I'm now going to hand over to my co convener, Elspeth Haston, to give us a short introduction to MIDS, and then we'll have some questions for clarification and discussion. Please use your chat to ask the questions and the moderator will read them out after Elspeth has finished her presentation. Thank you. Elspeth, over to you. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> so um, I'm just going to share my screen here, just one second. So hopefully you can all see, see the screen. Um, so um, Alex has given a, a really nice introduction to to the work that we're doing and the aims of the, um, the task group. And I just want to go through a few points, essentially before we get into some of the, some of the detail. Um, <clears throat> so there's a few things I just want to kind of cover. I know Alex has, has covered some of this already, um, but it's just to, to reinforce some of these, some of these questions. So, um, I wanted to talk through um, these four questions about whether the, this, you know, another standard is is actually needed. Is it uh, is this standard going to be relevant? Um, are we going to be able to measure it, and can it be implemented? So, first off, is it needed? And I've, I've been doing some number crunching, 
So, and thanks to other people who've helped pull these figures together as well. Um, so the, the latest estimate on the number of specimens held in natural history collections around the world um, is 3 billion. And of these, um, one question could be how many are digitized? And as Alex was saying, there's a lot of different opinions about what digitized means. So if we were to look at one of the largest um, global aggregators of uh, biodiversity data, if we look at GBIF, and um, I want to give a big um, thank you to uh, Tim Robertson, uh, Matt Blissett, and John Bajoric at GBIF who've been helping me with the, with the data and they provided this uh, really nice data set for me to work with. Um, so I've got 167, well, I've got 168 million records in GBIF um, for specimen occurrences. These are ones that have occurrence ID. And it gives you an idea of the kind of figures we're talking about. Um, so for preserved specimens, we're looking at about 160 million specimens. And so these have some kind of record, they've got some kind of digital record, so they have been digitized to some extent. Um, because they're in GIF. Um, there's also a caveat that there may be duplicates in there, um, I'm, and I'm aware of that. So, but how many can be considered to be uh, duplicate, uh, digitized will vary depending on each person's uh, definition of digitized. So, as Alex has said, has said before, um, you know, people, some people will consider uh, just the, the creation of it database record as digitized. Um, other people will say that digitized refers purely to taking an image of a specimen. So we need to be bringing this together, but in a kind of practical way, I wanted to look at some of the figures relating to this. Um, but when we are talking about digitization and um, is, it, is it needed, these are some of the some of the um, reasons I think that having a definition of digitization that we all agree on are needed. I mean, for, for all these kinds of things, for communication, for supporting collection management. Um, when we're looking at institutional, national, international targets, one of the targets we have for CTAF um, is 10% of our collections in Europe digitized. Um, but we need to know what we're talking about to achieve that target. Uh, enabling prioritization for digitization, uh, looking at costing. There's very different costs involved in whether you're purely taking a very um, skeletal, skeletal record of a specimen to whether you are um, um, capturing all the, the data relating to that specimen, whether it's on the label or whether it's um, externally. So, for all these reasons, we need we do need um, a clear definition of digitization. So, <clears throat> um, is it relevant? Well, one thing we have really aimed to do with this standard is make it very relevant to the needs of the community. So, with the levels that we have, um, have um, drafted, we've got uh, the three um, levels of uh, MIDS levels, which is the basic, regular, and extended. There's a kind of pre-level uh, catalogue um, concept, but, um, but we're going to concentrate really on those, those three levels um, for, for just now. So the mids level one is a kind of basic level. And essentially, this is enabling people to be able to find a specimen so they know uh, what it is and where it can be found. It also enables citation and other information to be attached unambiguously to a specimen. The regular record is, is really looking to, to the users of specimen data, um, particularly for scientific purposes. So the regular record um, has data that people would expect um, to be present for using it for uh, scientific purposes. It also includes information that have been used historically for citation. So that might be the collector and collector number or date and things, these things have been used um, 
to identify as a particular specimen in the past. Um, the extended is um, there's no real concept of a complete specimen record um, at, at present because there's always going to be more information coming in relating to the to, to the specimen, particularly when we're looking at um, linking to third party resources uh, sources, or if we're looking at um, producing more data from the specimen, whether that's molecular or anatomical. So therefore, as I say, we have been looking at the community requirements and needs and trying to um, align the, the standard to those. Um, as Alex has said, what, the importance of accessibility and availability essentially online um, is, is critical. So the definition of digital digitization also includes this concept of making the data publicly available. Um, online. So that is part of our um, the definition in the standard. So is it measurable? So um, when I was looking at the GBIF data set early, uh, that I talked about earlier, um, we have potentially um, about 105 and a half million specimens in GBIF, which um, from, from the measures that we've used are currently at MIDS level one. So essentially that's about 63% of specimens in GBIF are currently achieving MIDS level one. Um, that's, that's good news. Um, this, is, this equates, if we look at three billion specimens, that's about 3.5% of total estimated specimens. And of those, um, we have this concept of uh, MIDS level one I, and this is one uh, MIDS level one which with an image. And this is more difficult, but in, in GBIF, there is a way of measuring that. And when I use that measure in GBIF, we're looking at 3% of specimens that have um, at this level, MIDS, MIDS level one with an image. So essentially what we can say with that is that yes, MIDS level one and one I are measurable. Mids level two and up are, are more difficult. Um, and one of the key reasons here um, relates to missing data. And but we're, so we'll come on to that. But fundamentally, um, if we're looking at MIDS being implementable, then potentially. But I think what's becoming clear to me is that um, obviously, if we get the standard right and we agree on the on the elements within the standard, um, but also if the community um, agrees to to work on the missing data, I think this is going to be um, a real key part of of the of the standard. So, I'm going to pause there. I've got I've got other slides, but I'm going to pause there um, because. Before we get into kind of more detail, I think it'd be quite nice to have some discussion, see if there's any questions, any comments, um, and then we'll come back to to some more slides and looking at some more detail um, within the within the um, the standard itself and looking at the terms and the terminology. Um, so I'm going to first off um, stop sharing my screen and I'm just going to ask if um, are there any questions or comments at this stage. And I'm looking at the chat quickly. Yes, so one thing I'm seeing is, um, Matthias, yes, the, the presence of an image is, is a big thing and when we say, when we say that uh, the data have to be available and image have to be available online, then we need to be clear what we, in some ways, what we're meaning by, by that. Um, so th there has been some discussion um, and I think that the feeling, and I'm going to ask Alex for confirmation at this stage, but the feeling is that if it's online, whether it's on the institutional home, um, home um, collections catalog or whether it's in an aggregator such as GBIF, such as um, I know there's um, Species Link, CREA, um, there's a few other aggregators for different different types of specimens. I think we'd all be acceptable 
so therefore we would have to find ways of um, measuring the presence of image in different ways. And yes, I, 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 can add, I can add to that and say, yes, as, as long as the image is findable, F and accessible A, um, and, and ultimately R, reusable, um, then yes, the, the way that it's available online is less important. Yeah, and I think um, so at the moment, GBIF, I, one, one way um, I've been finding that information is with, um, actually I'll, I'll, I can show you later, but with, there is a, a field in GBIF for associated image, um, and it usually has a, a link to that image. Um, so that it's got some other things in there as well, but usually it would have a link to the image. Okay, so there are some questions appearing in the chat, Elspeth. Um, yeah. Uh, the first one comes from Ian and Engelbrack asking, asking uh, can we discuss more about missing data? And I think you'll come back to that uh, a little later on. Yes, um, it's going to be critical, so yes. Yes. Uh, the, 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 there's one from Joe Miller uh, about what, asking, is it evident what is the major reason that the data does not reach MIDS-1? Is there, a, is there any kind of pattern in the other 40%? And, and the answer to that is yes, um, because I've been looking at um, the different, um, the, particularly in GBIF, looking at the different um, queries to show where, where the data falls down. And again, we'll come, we'll, I think we'll come back to that because it should become clear as we go through the, the elements in more detail. So that should, that should be clarified. Tim, thank you very much. That's a nice link to um, Specimen Image Gallery. But I have to say I've used quite a lot myself. Um, Quentin is saying that if people don't put their data on GBIF, then it's not MIDS-1. Oh, no, and this is, this is interesting because I think um, this comes to the fact that the, it's about context. So you can have a mids level, maybe different depending on the context. So an institute could have an institutional mids level, whereby they, they have a certain number of specimens and data and images available on their institutional web, website um, and their portal. And that, so they would achieve maybe a mids level one or mid level two on their institutional homepage, but they, those specimens may not achieve mid level two on another place in, in GBIF, for example. So it is about context, I think. So you could, um, a collection could be mid level two in one place and mid level one in another place, depending on what data are available in those places. So I think there's a context to be thought of there. There's a comment from David Smith saying that the requirements for different audiences are different and, and although there is some overlap, finding a balance is going to be the tricky task. Um, I, I think that that's true as well uh, and I think later on in this session there's going to be an opportunity for, for all of these participants to this session to, to, to contribute their thoughts about what use cases need to be served by MIDS uh, and I think that will help us with you know, developing that balance over the over the uh, development period for this standard. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question from Nikki Nicholson. Is it possible to do a clustering exercise based on how the Darwin core fields are populated to see how GBIF mobilized, to see how records uh, mobilized into GBIF group up? Yes. Um... Tim says yes. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Last time I did it, there was a typical set of 25 Darwin core fields and they dropped off very, very quickly. Yeah, that, that's nice. <laughs> okay. David Smith, is data quality considered at all? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and I think that to a large extent, the quality of the data, to some extent, has to be outside the scope of this standard. 
I think to make it to make it workable, to make it. I think it, it potentially it's a separate standard. <laughs> so, so what I can do now is if 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 it's okay, I can what I can do is go into some a little bit more detail about some of um, what I found when I was looking at at the data. So yes, I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, okay, so this is start, we're starting to look at the information elements within the within the draft um, standard at at the moment. So if we're looking at mids level one. Then at the moment, these are the elements that we've identified. Um, and I would say that all of this is going to be, I think, part of the discussion of the task group is to go through each of these elements and work out um, how, it, how that element is going to work, in, particularly at a practical level. So essentially, as we've talked about, this is um, this, there's some metadata here relating to the um, to the to the record. So that basically who created the, the, the data record um, and the, the date of creation and modification. Um, but there's also some key elements here, which is the a physical specimen identifier, um, an institution code, the kind of material it is, and uh, an a taxon name. So essentially that is the kind of the what and the where and how can people find it. So when I looked at GBIF, um, this is the kind of thing I was starting to get. Now I'm also aware that I'm not necessarily the best person to be doing some of these queries and uh, so I've made it hopefully quite explicit about what I've been doing so that people can determine whether that was the right way of, of searching. Um, I was interested in um, some of the the um, the elements here we've got. So created on the the, the record creation um, is present in a very low number of specimens in GBIF. So 1.5% of the specimens I was looking at. Um, had uh, a value in this field. Um, the record creator, uh, I've got the V creator, the verbatim creator, is, is not present in any. Um, the physical specimen identifier, this, this is good news, um, the catalogue number, that 93.8% of specimen records in GBIF have a value in here. That's good news. As with institution code. So, um, being able to identify, uh, I find a specimen that's looking that's looking good. So we've got um, the date and time of subsequent modification. Um, that's actually that could potentially be very useful because that's going to tell you if the the record has that you're looking at has changed, if people have been updating it, and potentially potentially increasing the data attached to that. Um, then again, that is that's good. Um, that's 68.4%. Um, now the material type, there's two options here. One is um, the basis of record, so that's basically a preserved specimen, um, 100% because that um, GBIF, I think I'd be right in saying assigns that. Um, the preparation is um, submitted by the institute the, or the, the per during the, the upload process, and that's um, 39%, so it's a lower figure. And that's something I think we need to be looking at um, to see what we're actually looking for in the, for this element. Um, the name, the scientific name um, is 100%. I've, just, I've gone for scientific name as opposed to verbatim scientific name. Um, so some of these um, have been allocated um, by, by GBIF as well. So that's something to take into account, particularly when looking at the difference between verbatim and interpreted. Um, but it gets, gives, gives you a feel for what level one is looking like. And it, it also lets you see where, where some of the, the data, um, um, where some of the, mids, the specimens are not achieving 
mid to level one, then you can start to see here. So you can potentially modify, modify that that's where um, a lot of them fall down. In mid to level two, um, these are the data elements um, that we are currently um, expecting for a specimen to, re uh, to achieve mid to level two. And a key part of the data here, um, as well as the, the, the who and the when, so the collector um, and the collection date, a lot of the data in here are about geography, are about the place. And this, this is largely because um, a lot of the scientific research, biodiversity research, is dependent on particularly having a latitude and longitude um, on the specimen. So we do have latitude and longitude in here. Now that is immediately going to mean it's going to make things potentially quite hard, particularly for historical specimens, to achieve mids level two. It's going to in increase the importance of that georeferencing effort. So what does that look like in GBIF? So this is what it's looking like. Um, so we have a, a latitude and longitude. Oh, sorry, I've got the wrong um, term at the top. Well, bear with me. Um, but essentially, the latitude and longitude, um, if I'm looking at the V decimal latitude and V decimal longitude, we're looking at about 55.8% of specimens. Now, that is actually higher than I was expecting. Um, and that's one thing that we could potentially see going higher. Um, you'll notice that that percentage is higher, for example, than the number of specimens that have county um, in the, or altitude in there. Um, so one way of thinking is that some of these can be um, calculated. If you've got a lat latitude and longitude, you can calculate some of the these higher level um, ge geographical um, data fields. When we've got when we start looking at the um, the collector name and the, um, we're, we're, that's okay, seventy three percent. Looking at collector number, thirty percent. Um, so some of these are pretty low. One thing to notice is type status. So type status, one point nine percent. So essentially, if there's if there's no type status in there, um, then it's going to be a and if you can't assume that it's not a type, then it's going to knock off a lot of, of specimens from MIDS level two. Um, MIDS level three, I've not really looked at, and I think it makes sense to do this in a slightly kind of um, hierarchical way, is working through the, the different MIDS levels, um, starting potentially with MIDS level one going to mids level two, getting those kind of more sorted, more and clearer before going going on to mids level three. Um, and I'd say at the moment, I'm not really looking at mids level zero at the moment. So um, just to let you see, I had a look at some of the missing data um, to see what it looks like in GBIF. So if we're looking at collector, um, then if we look at the number of records that use these terms in the data field, um, it starts. You start to see what might be possible. And I know in ISTIG there was a there was a, a paper on this on looking at missing data, how to handle missing data. And I think this is going to be um, something we need to be looking at um, how we how we manage this. Um, but essentially, what we what I think we do need. For, for mids is we need to have some kind of value in these fields. You know, a null value is just not going to work. Um, you can see, um, for example, the collector number, um, the use of SN um, is, is, is pretty high. So there's some, there is definitely some consistency that we're seeing 
and I think that shows that there's there's possibilities for agreement and alignment in the future and it seems that people might be willing to use some kind of value um, in in these fields to help with missing data so again I'm going to stop there uh, sure. and hopefully that gives us a bit more for discussion it, do, it does. The, the chat has been buzzing while <laughs> while you've been talking. Um, I've got to find it, find where it picks up. Hang on a second. Uh, uh, his data uh, latest draft. Okay. So a question from Matthias Dillon. What's the source for the V created and V creator values that you uh, mentioned? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> and what I'm hoping, I guess. I mean, I'm really cl glad that. Tim seems to be there, but other people who are more familiar with, with GBIF as well and um, and sending their data to GBIF um, would be great to hear from. Should I answer that one? Yes. Uh, I think that V created would be the, the, a Darwin core term that says something like created. I don't have it right on hand right now, but... Um, the, Sorry, the, I didn't see the answer yet in the chat. I haven't got there. Yeah. Okay, but thank okay, you, I'm not sure. I'll have to have a look. Sorry. Um. Okay, so the, there's a there's a bunch of uh, I think kind 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 of similar questions here uh, coming from, for example, Tim Robertson or Anna Kovain. Um, you know, if 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 a record is 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 perfectly formed in many respects, you know, has most of the information fields. Uh, but something is missing. Um, you know, uh, does it still achieve, you know, for example, mids level two, yeah. um, or, or does it revert to a lower level? Yeah, it. I mean, the, the answer to that is, 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 I think, is how it, how the missing information is is indicated. If if the um, uh, it if the information element is completely blank, then uh, you know, one, one suggestion might be that it reverts to a lower level. But if there is something in the information field that indicates the reason you know, as to why the information is missing, either such as it doesn't exist or it hasn't been digitized or, or, or that kind of thing, then that might allow the record to, to, you know, to still achieve a particular level. This is part of the how to deal with missing data uh, discussion. Could I please just make a comment about that? Sure, Tim, go ahead. It's actually a question of redundant data. Um, in Darwin Core, there's, for example, there's several fields that can that allow you to repeat the same information. So the, the question I had is if someone provides a perfect coordinate, um, with geodetic data or the, um, the spatial reference system that they're using, but they don't fill in a textual description for the locality and the country, would you still achieve MIDS level two? Because you're providing a perfect location for the specimen, but you've left other things null. And it's a tricky one because some of those other fields can change over time, where, you know, counties change their name, for example. I'm wondering if you have a plan to, to handle that. I think the answer is we are we are open to suggestions about a plan. Uh, we've certainly had discussions about different 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 ways that it might be handled. For example, if you have the the geo information, you can infer the country and the locality, but it's only accurate at the time that you you, you make that interpretation. Uh, and, and so the question then becomes, do you, do you then add an indication of when the interpretation was added? Uh, do you add an indication as to whether uh, the information that's provided is an interpretation or whether it's verbatim information uh, that's captured from somewhere? You know, there, there's a number of different possible ways of doing it. And it yeah, it's, 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 yeah. I think it's going to be really a really important question for for the implementation as well. I think that the 
the particularly the I mean thankfully there's a lot of people working on georeferencing but where you are are um, assigning a georeference um, a lat long from for example let's say it's a, a centroid so you're using the higher level geographic information to give you the the latitude and longitude um, you need to be very careful and then how you do backwards inferring for um, for some of the higher level geography in the future. So I think um, having the the additional data to, um, attached to the georeference to, so that people are very clear in how that latitude and longitude was was assigned, I think it's going to be really critical here as well. You have a couple of hands up. Okay. Go to the hands. Yes. Um, I think, yeah, Dimitri, you're the first one. I think I assume the hands are in order. Hello. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I would like to follow a bit. I mean, listening to Alspen, fantastic work on on doing this matching exercise, and actually following a bit on Tim's question, it makes me wonder about. The, the level of through which we need to be very strict on how we apply those meets levels. And the reason I'm saying this, I'm looking that obviously meets one and meets two have a, 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 a great gap between them, in fact. And I'm also, I do understand that the reason of having this classification is because we want to give an, first of all, idea to people about the, the level of completeness in terms of the digitization process. But I also understand that this kind of, of classification we act will act as a as a threshold, as a bar of performance in the future in terms of how organizations really handle the information and digitize information move forward. And if you put into the equation all the, the, the very interesting aspects that you presented, Elspeth, about the, how the lack of, of information in certain fields implies actually um, uh, missing data rather than um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, missing um, information from the point of view of the specimen rather than missing data, then I think we should consider how we potentially create a bit more flexible environment through which we classify those, those entries in a way that I think we need to empower and incentivize people to do better. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they will necessarily read MITS 2 or MITS 3 in this process immediately. And we have to work with, a, with the existing, obviously, line of uh, mobilized information that has its own shortcomings. And, and that needs to be in, in part of it. So have you, have you considered how we, I, I don't want to include another level, like it's 1.5 or things like that, but, but have you considered how potentially we will be able to more um, flexibly classify those entries according to those means levels? Yeah, it's, 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 a good, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll come in first and then see what Alex and anyone else thinks on this. Um, I think that... Oh no, the coffee. The, the, <laughs> the flexibility um, I think the mids is not, would hopefully not preclude flexibility, but it wouldn't necessarily be within the mids. So for example, um, people can still work and determine their priorities for, for digitization and for, and for measuring where they are with their, with their collections. Particularly researchers might be um, looking to, um, to pull data and they may be using other things other than MIDS to do it if it's if they're looking for a bit more flexibility. Um, I think what 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 I hope that MIDS could do is that it would allow clear communication. So, particularly for example, if um, if you're looking at um, funding, if if you're putting in a funding application for digitization and you're saying, right, we're going to fund, we're looking for funding to digitize to MIDS level one or to MIDS level two. 
it means that it's really clear about what what that digitization um, project is actually going to achieve at the end of the day. So it allows that real clarity. And it means that um, for some projects, the funding might be required to MIDS level one is, is entirely adequate for that first stage of digitization. And I think it's important to see this digitization as a staged process. It's not, in most cases, it's not just a, a, a a single um, event. It's kind of a staged series of events over time. And I think it, it helps if you can then work through the mids levels. Um, and I think that if you if you are doing that, then what the mids levels might then do is prioritize the, the data to be captured at each of these levels. And I think the, the question then is, have we, got, have we got the data fields right for the different levels? I think, and I think that would be, I'd really like to hear back from people if they agree on the, the elements that we've included at each level, are those the right data elements for each level? And does it, does it fit with, the digitization that people are actually doing on the ground as well. Okay, thank you, Elspeth. I, I, mean, I think the, the point that Demetrius raises is, is a very helpful one, and uh, we will ensure that it's taken account of in, in, in thinking and the work of the task group as we move forward. Uh, James Macklin's also got his hand up. James, do you want to make a remark? Please, thank you. Yes, please. So this is following up on something that uh, Walter put in the chat already. But uh, it's basically saying that if we supply an image, we are by default supplying the verbatim information about that specimen. And machines are getting very good at reading this information. We've been using the Google API, image API. Uh, handwriting is extremely good now, uh, so shockingly good. Uh, and uh, because of this, I think we have to be careful in our definitions about what the availability, especially of the verbatim data is because machines can read these things. Now humans have not typed it out into the computer, but our parsers are also getting better. And so we can make the OCR materials available for text mining right away, which, which extracts information. And then we can use the parsers to structure that information into its component parts. Now, okay, those aren't typed into the fields that are in GBIF uh, or in your collection management systems, maybe, but they are certainly available as verbatim information, both as evidence uh, and, you know, backing up whatever there might be in whatever mids level you're at, especially the, the lower ones. So I think in this day and age with technology, you have to be a little careful about how we define digitization and the availability of those kinds of information. Indeed, and 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 Quentin you know, pointed out also in the in the chat that mids levels should be should be calculable by machines. And of course, if machines are doing this work of actually filling the information elements, you know, as a result of you know analysing images of labels, etc., um, it becomes much easier, much quicker, much faster, more accurate than than that done by human. It's the point I made yesterday: is that you know traditionally we assume that. That, that, that it's humans with, that work with specimens, but increasingly it's going to move machines that work with images and data about specimens. Okay, are there any other um, uh, comments or questions? I'm sorry if we haven't addressed all of the questions that are raised in the chat. Um, but we will take the chat away and uh, uh, and take into account all of the points uh, that have been raised there. So thank you very much for that. Yes, yeah, so I was just going through some more of the the, the chat as well. Walter's got his hand up. Walter, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Quentin make one additional comment. Uh, I saw a, a lot of um, comments in the chat about um, data quality and 
I think the purpose of of, of these mids levels is is um, primarily to uh, indicate whether um, information is present or absent, and not so much to indicate what what the quality of the data in a field, but rather whether a field is is present in these fields. Of course, when you know that, you can use that um, uh, uh, to to then start looking at, at the content and the quality of the content. Yes, that's right. I mean, uh, mid, up, up until this point, the, the scope of MIDS do, does not uh, uh, include solving the problem of, 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 of publishing junk data. Um, the expectation is that you know, institutions that are, that are publishing data should have you know, adequate quality pr procedures and controls in place during their digitization processes to, to ensure that you know the published data is you know is, is as valid as it can be um, but of course that doesn't prevent that uh, you know data can always be improved retrospectively and I think I think the scope for the for the mids levels to to help with some of the workflows of digitization as well so um, if we are clear that set specimens, um, for example, don't have a lat latitude and longitude, um, then you know, potentially we need to look at those specimens. Is it because it's just not being transcribed or is there just not a latitude and longitude and does that need to go through a kind of pipeline for georeferencing? So it's kind of the, it's organizing the pipelines for digitization as well. I think MIDS can, can potentially play a part in, in that process as well. So I think, um, Deb, you're, you're um, asking whether we can really populate fields with more meaningful values. Um, and that, that's, what I, <laughs> that's one question I've been, um, been tackling and mulling over for some time now. Um, and I, I would love to hear people's views on this one as well. I mean, my, my feeling is as an institute, which is one that we've been discussing actively, and we're looking at ways and means of, of doing that. I would love to hear if other people are doing it. From the data, it looks like some people are, or some institutes are doing it. I've not explored which institutes those, those are coming from. But what, what do people think? Deb what, Deb, what do you think? So, I don't know. I, I too would be interested in others. I, I have my experience uh, um, in the Morphbank project where I found that it's very difficult to do that because if you put, and this is somewhat philosophical, but if you put unknown in a bucket for a field, does that mean you don't know it? Does someone else know it? Does that mean it's not on the label that you couldn't read it? I mean, it, it, you start to get into all these, the digital humanities have been dealing this with for a long time. How do you put a term in there? that can be unambiguously understood by the people that are trying to use the data. Um, and so you have to define what you mean by the term you agree to put in there. Um, but this sort of gets into the, the next question, which is if you do have a bunch of empty fields, null values, is there a way in which you could say, this is the best I can do? Like I've got these primary sources, the label, the field notebook, if you could say, here are my sources, and all the data that could be captured out of those has been populated. So therefore, the researcher could say, oh, well, this field's empty because there's no more information to put in there from this source. So would that be a sort of partner to this notion of trying to do something about the null values? I'd be interested to hear what other people think about null versus someone trying to put in unknown. I have two quick comments on that, and I, I, this comes up a whole lot. And um, I, I have a very strict policy about this, and usually people don't follow me along with this kind of thing. But I think if you have a column, the only values that should go on that column reflect the name of that column. For example, if you have gender, the only value, values, male and female, question mark, NA, NK, whatever it is, are not genders, so they shouldn't be there. And you assume that if it's a null value, that the person doesn't know for whatever reason. And if it's not known or NA, there's not really, there's only so much value to that, right? It's really, you know what I mean? I mean, I understand the context. I understand like our, our curious collection managers, they like not known in there. 
the first level database they entered into because it keeps track of things in their mind, right? They know that it's not somebody skipped it. It's because they've actually looked at it and they really don't know. And I understand the value of that. But beyond that, I have a hard time seeing how it would ever be useful to know that not known in a gender field. It really should only be, you know, gender values. It's anything for measurements or any other thing. That not known, question marks, NA, all those things that people love to enter into. Just have no value if they're not. You know, it should be of that color. I really, I'm, I'm just talking about this. And I think, assume, and this may be all over idealized, but assume that the person that's published the data has already made that best face of it. That what they've put out there is their best attempt at this. And so that's sort of an assumed function. That sort of falls in line with, if it's null value, you should always assume that they just don't know for whatever reason. You know, and there could be a remarks field, you know, why don't you know? That's a whole separate, in my mind, that's a whole separate question. You know, why is that knowledge a remarks field and things for that, but different mechanisms. But um, I, I really, I'm <laughs> very strong about this. And internally, I have issues in issues my own collection, uh, collection manager, my institution, about this very thing. They love not know. They, <laughs> they all do. And so, but I, I delete them immediately before I publish, just because it's just not, there's no value to that on the external facing uh, portal. And if they really want to know, they can, you know, talk to them. But, but past internally, I, I'm just really big about the values in that column are of that column. And that's it. There's no... Yeah anything else you know what I, mean? I, I, I tend to agree that you know, the, the just knowing that something is unknown is not terribly helpful no um, you know, qualifying it by saying why it might be unknown uh, for example because the information is missing or because the information has not been digitized or because it was indecipherable or, or withheld is, is a much more useful uh, 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 piece of information in effect yes uh, and, and and Alex, I think, and Ian's going to say what you're going to say next, I think, in the chat here, is that that's the, the point I was making about mm -hmm. perhaps what's also needed in, in addition is, Ben, it's sometimes in your example, it might be empty because they haven't gotten to it yet. It might be this skeletal record, this mids level zero or one, right? And so it's, it's empty because, and, and you need, but if you're going to publish that data at that level, it'd be nice for the researcher to pull that out and go, oh, you know, this is mids level zero, and this says, you know, there's more data, right? It tells you that there's more information, the buckets are empty because they haven't been, been filled out yet. So, so it's interesting, because um, as an institute, we, we, we do have a field that does this, that um, whether a, a, a record is partially or completely transcribed, um, the complete always bothers me because um, as soon as someone puts another debt slip on that on that specimen, then that and if that that's not captured, then that is no longer complete, as it were. Um, but the, 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 there is a slight issue there because the partial different people have different partials, so um, it still wouldn't field by field. You wouldn't necessarily know if that field has not been entered because the data weren't present or it's just that someone didn't transcribe them so it's it, it's still difficult um but i think i i kind of i completely understand your point then that that you should you should just that that data should be clear as to and it should be relevant to the to the um, to the um, element that you're trying to capture data about. But I also think that the the the, the whole range of reasons that the data have not been captured. I think we need to have that record that somewhere because that's really useful for the users. But is that best done in a separate field and by a separate mechanism? In my mind, it is. Keep those fields clean, but have a separate mechanism to, but I know it's very, having one column is very hard. If it's complete or it's not complete, well, what's not complete about it, right? That's hard to do. And I understand that. At the same time, I feel like this could be a runaway thing that you'll have a qualifier for every field. And it's very hard to sort of, you'll just end up with these massive over abundance of information. Um, that's, I guess that's argue if that's possible, but. Um, but some sort of separate mechanism for the completeness of the record, I think is more better suited for this. Cause that in a sense, that column is of that call, right? The information in that column is whether it's complete or not. And it's not sort of cross-reference where you don't have, if you have a question mark in gender, 
it really goes in a remarks field about the completeness of the record instead of the gender field because question marks on a gender, but question mark is of the column where you actually comment that information, right? But I mean, I, I, I see it, it is true. You can't have separate notes field for everything. <laughs> it's like verbatim. It's like, can we have a verbatim for everything? <laughs> can we have a notes field for every field? We can solve every problem that way. We'd have 400 fields and no one else get any data. But still, it, it's all our problem. It, it, sometimes you think come down to decision making processes too. I mean, what's the best solution for the end product too? I mean, you only can do so many things. But um, I do think it, a single complete, a single field for completeness is probably important if you had some sort of context with it. But maybe not beyond that. You have a couple of hands up. Yeah, so um, Ian, did you want to come in? Um, yeah, yeah, thanks guys. Um, so, so this is um, quite pertinent to us uh, here in South Africa at the moment because we're about to publish a, like a minimum data standard for our museums and herbaria, which says um, what we want them to do. So. Um, so yeah, so if you could just please tell us what to include when the field's null, I'd, I'd be very appreciated, uh, very <laughs> appreciative. So one, um, thing I, one thing I have done just to say is that there's a, I put a link in the chat to a paper that was um, published from the, uh, quite recently, it's in the database journal um, and there's some, there's some um, suggestions and recommendations in there. So I would, I would look at that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, yeah, I was gonna say in the reverse direction, Ian, if, if you're about to, you know, to offer guidance to your institutions about what minimum information they should be publishing, I think we would be very interested in seeing that if you're willing to share it with the task group. Um, because yeah, one of the things we want to do is is you know in formulating you know such a standard is 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 also to gather what is current practice or upcoming practice. Uh, that's being promoted in different parts of the world. So if you're willing to share that, I'd be very grateful. And then one more, yeah, and yeah, then what about a year later? <laughs> how, su <laughs> how successful has this minimum standard been and what adjustments you've had to make a year, you know, two years down the road? Okay, Ian, did you have another point or should, can I go to the next person? Yeah, I think you had another point, was that I just... Yeah, that like so, so I was just, I was just gonna say that, um, that uh, just responding to Ben is that the example of you know, gender is quite a specific example where, um, yes, you know, if you don't have something that indicates male or female in the gender field, you know, it's not really useful for a field like that. Um, but a counter example is something like the collector number where the convention is to indicate um, SN if there's no number and, um, and we can see there how useful that actually is. And I think for fields like a locality, you know, if, if there's a blank locality in a database, like, you know, it would be really useful to know what that, what that means. That's it. Really okay. If there's a blank Thank locality, you. there's gotta be some sort of specific reason for that. And that seems really important for sure. Okay. Um, Thank you, Ian. Okay, so let's go to Thomas Arrow, please. Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good, good to hear this conversation. Uh, with uh, our records, uh, we, we thought about this a lot at Natural History uh, Smithsonian. Um, I think if, if the idea is to get to a, a set of core fields for a, at least for a, you know, a minimum set of information, anytime we can use controlled vocabularies for those fields to limit uh, free text unknowns, uh, I think that's really the key to success combined with overall rating of the overall record. So we built that into our system where key fields have controlled vocabulary. So, Something like unknown uh, isn't helpful, but uh, not designated, say, in the source or, or whatever those control vocabularies be for every value field. That builds on uh, basically an overall uh, strength to the record because then there is not a, you don't, somebody doesn't have to go post process to understand why there's a deficiency. It's explicit in the record. And then an overall characterization of the, the, the strength of that record is important. So the value, uh, is it a fully, fully uh, uh, filled out record? That would be your highest rating, all the way down to you know, absolute skeletal record. And those all could be based on the, the, the metadata of the record plus the explicit values in those core fields. Together, then you don't have to go back and figure this out. So everything moving forward, 
uh, has that as it's as it's as it's disseminated. So I think that's kind of the way we think about it, uh, and I hope uh, that that could help with with this discussion. Thank you, Thomas. Um, just to okay. well, if anyone else has got a hand up, I'm not seeing more hands up at the moment. No, I'm not either. Um, so, should we um, should we move on with the agenda a bit, Elspeth? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, let me share my screen then again. Um, let's just make, make sure I'm sharing the right thing. Um, Okay, so we, that, that was uh, an introduction followed by a, a very helpful uh, discussion and we will record all the points uh, and save the chat, etc., cetera, and, and take that all into account. Um, I just briefly want to uh, go through the, uh, the plan for the, uh, the proposed work, which is based upon the, the section in the, the charter that's headed a uh, strategy. Um, I don't think we need to spend uh, too long on this unless anybody has any specific issues with it. Um, but basically, we have uh, said that we will begin some, some monthly virtual working sessions where we can continue this discussion among the interested participants. Um, we haven't set the date for the first one of those uh, yet, but it, it's likely to be around the beginning of November, I would think, uh, probably six to eight weeks from, from now. Um, we, we have a short list of people that we know are already specifically interested in the work of this task group and have signed up to become involved. Um, but if your name has not yet appeared on that list uh, and you would like to get involved and contribute, then please contact uh, either myself or, or Elspeth and we will make sure that you, you go onto a mailing list of, of some kind. Um, we're going to, as you may know, I, I didn't mention it already, but this, this task group has been set up as a, uh, a task group under the, the supervision of the, the Collection Descriptions Interest Group, which is uh, convened by Matt Woodburn and, and Deborah Paul. Um, and we're going to take a lot of inspiration about how we run the work of this task group from the way that that interest group runs its uh, uh, work on, on the Collection Descriptions uh, Standard. Um, and of course, we will use GitHub as, as the coordination platform for that, uh, where you'll, you'll be able to find all the introductory and background documentation, um, all of the issues, such as the ones that, that have been raised during this discussion, will be recorded there as separate GitHub, GitHub issues with their own uh, tracked discussions and, and, and ultimate resolutions. Uh, there will be a task plan with responsibilities and, and versioned drafts of the specification um, and a portfolio of use cases, which I mentioned that uh, we will collect from across the community, which will uh, support uh, what, what this, this standard needs, needs, needs to do. Um, I hope all of that will be fairly straightforward uh, stuff for, for people to get engaged with and, and, and follow. Um, and the, also as part of this plan for the work, we're of course looking for um, you know, uh, interested parties uh, to implement and evaluate the, um, uh, the requirements of this, uh, this proposed standard uh, and to feed back into the process. So uh, again, if you are uh, uh, potentially an interested party in implementing uh, somewhere in your institution, then please contact either myself or, or, um, or Elspeth. Um, okay, so um, are there any questions or comments or concerns about um, that outline of the plan and how we're going to work? We'll put it all into place over the next few weeks. silence as as it's all wonderful so thank you for that um, okay so let's move on to the last part of the agenda um, and uh, here we'd like you to start getting involved already and um, 
we, we've mentioned already use cases, user stories uh, that will allow us to, to, to drive uh, the standard in the direction which supports the widest set of needs and which can be used for evaluation of the standard. And uh, we want to you know, identify these from, from different parts of, of the community, um, botany, zoology, marine, land, uh, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, already uh, some of the com uh, comments in the chat show that there are, uh, there are differences between different parts of the community in, in terms of needs for, for minimum information. So we may need to make sure we capture us user stories for that. The question really is, what are the minimum information use cases uh, that you have that, that this mid standards uh, need needs to support? And if you're not a if you're not familiar with this this idea of uh, uh, oh, of a user story, you can see it illustrated on the right hand side there uh, 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 as an outline. It, it has this form uh, as a something I want to achieve at something so that I can do something. Um, for example, you know, as a scientist, I want to be able to identify uh, all specimens from a, a particular region so that I can plot their distribution on a map, for example. Uh, and then optionally, you can qualify that by saying, you know, the kinds of information that you need to be able to, to do that thing. So what we'd like you to do is to, to take uh, five uh, or, or 10 minutes now to, to enter some ideas into, into some Google slide templates that we've, we've set up. Um, you'll find the link there and somebody will paste it into the chat, I hope, MIDS user stories. Um, please duplicate the template slide, um, add your name to it if you like, or do it anonymously. It, 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 it doesn't, doesn't really matter and contribute your ideas for the kinds of user stories that you you, you have in your your area of work in your institution um, that you think MIDS uh, needs to cater for. So let's take some time to do that and in a moment I will share the slides on, on the screen and we'll see how that's developing. I can see certainly there's people going in which is great. And if anyone has any questions or um, is uncertain how to do things like duplicate the slide, just shout and we'll help. So it seems we have about 20 plus people entering information into these slides at the moment, which is really great. Thank you. And what we can do is we can keep these, we can keep these, the, this open so that people can add later as well. Yes, so, of course.
do enter more than one story if you have one. I'm just looking at an interesting one now, which is um, it takes the perspective of a, of a, of a, of a, of a machine or a, a software tool rather than the perspective as of, a, of a human, which is, which, is, uh, which is nice. As a trait extraction tool, I want to be able to select all specimens that have images of the object so that I can use the images to extract the traits. That's nice. I think, I think it's good that uh, we don't just think about the user as being the human, the role as being a human user. another one here that takes the role of a funder who wants to, to be able to um, filter specimens according to their distribution to see what um, the impact of funding is on the support of collection and digitization efforts. I want others to know the value of the overall record that I'm providing by, by, by measuring its completeness and, and deficiencies. I want to find as many records as possible. Quentin's put his name to this one. As an IT manager, I want to create key performance indicators for my boss so that they see that I do something. For this, I need some value that reflects the enrichment of data. There's an interesting one here about finding uh, specimens that are duplicates of specimens that I have so that I can um, reduce duplication of effort um, uh, in annotating specimens or applying annotations across, across duplicates. For anybody who's uh, just joining the session, uh, the session participants are working on uh, generating MIDS user stories. Um, the link is in the chat if you want to join in, duplicate a slide and, uh, and enter some examples. And I think um, 
one thing that would be interesting, and it could be also come into the the use cases, is so we've heard from um, one person already looking at um, trying to implement and or launch um, some kind of digitalization standard for their community. Um, so I guess the other question I've got is, is anyone else going, other institutes or communities going through this process as well in different parts of the world? And it'd be really, really good to hear of other initiatives that are looking at this as well. So if anyone is aware of any of those, either if you put it in the chat or if you if you put your hand up or um, if you put it into a, a user story, um, it would be great to hear. Um, sorry, just to just to be clear, um, I'm just going to check because it was I think it was Ian that was um, looking at um, something along the lines of mids for for the South African community. Um, but it'd be interesting um, to hear of any others initiatives like that that are that are launching at the moment or or people are thinking about launching that initiative for their community, whether it's a particular taxonomic community or a geographic community. Um, it would be really good to hear. Yes, I agree. Yes, thank you. As a publisher, I want to point explicitly to individual digital objects so that authors can specify exactly what is being referred to. Uh, as a collection manager, I want to know what proportion of the collections are stored in ethanol so I can make a plan to meet fire safety requirements. Uh, as a collection manager, I want to cure my addiction to creating skeleton records so that I have a cleaner database and pipeline. Um, uh, I want to be able to assess the completeness of my data records uh, so that my data is of reasonable, reasonably even quality. I need a comparative standard for judging this. Uh, as a software developer, I want to use the different mids levels as guidance to focus development of new software on the most relevant fields first. Uh, I want to know that as a digitization manager, I want to know the depth of digitization so that I can assign staff and money to that collection. As a paleontologist, I want to look at geographic distributions of Ordovician fossils so that I can see who, how they've changed through the, the Ordovician uh, era was a time of heightened diversification and extinction. For this I need fossil records identified at a minimum to genus level with georeferencing, uh, period and age and lithography. Um, as a herbarium database manager, I want to make as much data possible to the public. As a scientist or curator or museum's director, I want to get information about how this object came to the museum uh, so that I can now evaluate it if it came in a sensible way. Uh, as a policymaker, I want to assess the digitization level so that funding can be reallocated. I think um, in the chat, I think Quentin's put a, a, a point in there that I want to pick up on as well. And I think it's it's a good point um, because 
to to a certain extent it's it's kind of working out what the meds is a, aiming to do and what it's not aiming to do um and some of this is going to be coming out of the user stories and we'll see how that fits with with what the mids can can do and where it can answer people's people's needs um but i think as quentin points out um if researchers are looking to, to, it may be researchers or it may be um bioinformaticians are looking um to get data sets for specific purposes um mids may be able to help um MIDS may be able to help produce those data sets in the first place, but they may not help the user for, to, to pull the, the data set that they need. Um, and they may be using different ways of, of doing that. So a, a MIDS level two data set, for example, is not just by having MIDS level two, is not necessarily going to answer the, the requirements for, for a researcher because it may be mids level two, but as we've already discussed, there may be missing data in there. So for the researcher, they may require, um, for example, the name of a collector in, in that data set and the term unknown or missing or illegible is not gonna help them when they're doing their data. So they, they will be using other tools for potentially filtering and pulling their data sets. So it's just, I guess, that kind of recognition and how those, how those fit together. But I think what we might find is that hopefully the MIDS will, will continue the, the process of prioritization of, of data capture that people are already working on, um, but it may help to institutes to, to push those prioritizations forward in some ways to create those data sets for the researcher then to use. Quentin, yeah. Yeah, sorry, for some reason, maybe the host can't put their hand up, I don't know. <laughs> um, one thing that's worth pointing out is you say MIDS data set, a, a MIDS for a data set, but a MIDS is actually calculated at a specimen level. So, you, so a data set will actually have a MIDS profile, not a, it'll have an average MIDS, but half of those may be zero and half of those might be two you don't really know unless you see the full profile and publishing the mids profile of a data set might be quite a interesting thing to do um maybe i'll try and write that into a uh, use case but i think it's an important distinction to make yeah. between the data set and the specimen I, I think picking up also on what Elspeth was saying there, uh, there's an in, another interesting comment in the chat from uh, Takaru Nakazata um, you know, saying that you know, minimum information is not just a, a, a GBIF issue, and, and I agree uh, completely with, with, on, on that point. Uh, but he goes on to point out that you know, uh, devices such as monitoring ones um, uh, that are outputting data that is being collected, you know, should, you know, you know could could output minimum levels of information based upon you know, such a standard as, as mid, MIDs as well. And, and, and not just devices, of course, but you know, gathering events you know, in the field you know, should be aiming to gather the minimum levels of information you know, right at the beginning, especially as, uh, as specimens become increasingly uh, born digital, as, as Helen Hardy likes to, to put it. Um, so yes, there's a, you know, there's a, there are a range of different uh, you know, application areas where, where, where such a standard is relevant. Oh, I need some power. Okay. Yeah, so David, um, David Shorthouse, um, my, my lack of mathematical scientific thing here, that does mean MIDS does not equal filter for doing science, doesn't it? That, that slash means not yeah, equal. That that Tell was my that's interpretation right. as well. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I can I can see that activity in the the, the Google Slides has uh, has dried up uh, a bit now. Uh, we, we there are there are forty eight slides in the slide set. Um, 
I think one or two of them are empty. So there's probably uh, uh, 40, 40 or so user stories in that. And, uh, 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 and I think I, I've read some of them out as we've been going along uh, uh, you know, to, to try and illustrate the, the, the range of different stories that are beginning to appear from different areas of, of the community. So thank you very much for, for, for doing all of that. Um, as Elspeth uh, said earlier, we will keep this set of slides open for, for a while longer, another 24 hours or so. And so if you wish to, to come back, uh, you know, within the next uh, day or so and, and add some additional information, some new ideas that you have, uh, or at even any time in the future, just, just do that uh, or let us know. Um, and uh, we will capture all of these and these will all be moved into the user stories part of the uh, the, the, the GitHub repository that, that we will set up. So thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so um, I think we've covered more or less everything on the agenda. Let me just find it again. Um, Yeah, um, let's go back to where the agenda was. Yeah, so we've we've talked about the background and purpose of the task group. Uh, we've had an introduction and discussion about MIDS. Uh, we've outlined uh, our plans for the, um, the next weeks, uh, starting with some monthly working sessions, which we encourage you to, to sign up to and contribute to. Um, we've begun to engage you by collecting your ideas for uh, user stories that MIDS needs to, to support um, and I think that's you know pretty much my, my, my summary of what we've achieved. It's been very very useful I, I think. Um, a lot of very very good uh, questions and comments that have been uh, made both verbally and in the chat which we will uh, I have saved um, and that will go into the meeting notes and will be carried forward. Um, so if there are no further questions or comments, I think we're probably uh, at about the point that we can bring this to a close. What do you think, Elspeth? Yep. Um, so we'll just give people just a last, you've got a last chance of um, getting Saying some, anything you like. <laughs> comments in. <laughs> any questions, any comments, any recommendations, suggestions, any offers of, um, of help in the future and engagement of this would all be appreciated. No, I think, I think we're good. Eat, oh, somebody dragged themselves out of bed at 2 a.m. <laughs> well done, Richard, thank you. <laughs> I'm impressed. Where in the world is it 2 a.m. at the moment? <laughs> Australia, isn't it? <laughs> or somewhere? <laughs> New Zealand. <laughs> oh, well, why? <laughs> That's great. Hawaii, okay. Aloha. Great. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for your contributions. It's been great. It's been a great help. Uh, and look forward to carrying this forward over the next uh, year to 18 months. Thank you now. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Oh, and Eli. Eli is civ a civilized 11.30 p.m. <laughs> Somewhere. East Coast, Australia. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.